exclusive, expensive and extraordinary that you can say about those competitors in the segment of luxury sedans which you still mainly drive yourself. Let's take it that way. In Germany we call this segment the upper mid-size segment, so between the mid-size sedans, which would be A4, 3 Series C-Class, S60 and the big luxury sedans, which often also have chauffeur purposes like A8, S-Class and 7 Series. So this is about the Audi A6, in exterior, interior and driving versus the BMW 5 Series, exterior, interior and driving versus the Mercedes E-Class and the Volvo S90. All four sedans aim at the similar target group, but which one is the best for you? Which one is your favorite? Let's take a look at all those vehicles, vote and discuss with us in the comments. Let's go! The all new generation of the Audi A6, the big luxury sedan. Can it be best in segment? That was the question you've asked me. And we will of course experience that together. For the exterior, which is the unique setting for this vehicle? How is it different to the A7 and the A8? Interior, what have they done there? Also technology wise, infotainment wise, if you compare it to the competitors. Also with a night driving special there. And of course the driving experience. How does it master the compromise between sportiness and the luxury? In the front we can see an evolution of the design, so it's not super different than the predecessor version and it also has similarities with the A7 and the A8. Overall the A7 has this rather sporty approach, the A8 the very classic one with the luxury orientation and this one here is somewhat in between. It is also the S line we have here today for you with a black single frame grille, really large. We have those sensors here in the front where they can still keep the 3D Audi logo I like that because sometimes those logos are replaced nowadays have 2D logos sensor be behind that here they have the sensor on the side overall 38 assistance systems available overall we will talk about them very soon also in the lower part the stronger bumper with the S line those headlights come standard with LED however those ones here are the optional matrix LED light with spectacular functions and we did caught some night shots this time so very soon in a special um, special clip will also show you how it was driving at night and with a pretty spectacular effect I can tell you. 4 meters 93 or 16 foot 2 is the total length of the all new Audi A6 so the exterior dimensions haven't really changed that much. The rim style starts with 17 inch optional 21 inch maximum those ones here 20 inch so um, yeah they're already quite huge they are okay in the riding comfort, I can already tell you right now. Soon more to that in the driving part. S-Line badge right there, also with a sportier bumper then. The color, by the way, what would you say? Is it white or is it gray? It is called Suzuka gray, but it's somehow also white, depending also on the camera shot. Um, it's something in between. Then the very classic sedan shape. You know this will also be available as an A6 Estate or Avant, as we say in Germany, is when you want to have you know, more versatility. Then what is Audi doing design-wise? You can see here a dropping line on the height of the door handle, dividing in light and shadow. And it's been picked up here by a second design line to form a little stronger shoulder. Overall, they use sharp design lines, whereas Mercedes more goes for those round central lines. This is definitely a matter of taste. Do you like this one more than the E-Class? Tell me in the comments. And to the rear here again, more sharper design lines leading up to those taillights. And let me tell you something about suspensions already right here because it always fits to the side profile here. 
we have four different suspensions. Base, sport suspension, 20 millimeters lower, adaptive sport suspension, and the air suspension, which is top trim, and also built in this very vehicle. It is worth the extra price if you have the money. Otherwise, the base trim will also do just fine if you want to more go for a fleet budget solution. And now to the rear part here. It's a design that is very horizontally oriented with those new taillights that stress the width of the vehicle. 55, by the way, is the batch here for the three liter engine and they have this no nomenclature which I do not agree with because 55 five is telling me nothing basically about the vehicle. It's just a fantasy figure but they have this you know this strategy that they have basically a stair strap strategy and then different horsepower figures stand for different numbers and again they don't make any sense. In the lower part they have this fake exhaust design and this is just I mean they could just also have saved that. Um, it also looks a little bit strange in the S-Line if you drive behind the car uh, and have those layers here. It looks really squarish, a um, little bit, you know, like a, like, a, um, like a hovercraft or something like that. So I think a very evolutionary design, but in the rear they actually played around a little bit. And also interesting, if you compare the A7 and the A8, this one here, the A6, goes really straight. Whereas the A8 goes a little bit inward like this in the yard design or boat design and the A7 goes a little bit like this from a more sporty approach. Engines. This one here is the 3 liter TFSI turbo petrol engine with 340 horsepower. The overdrive distribution is always 40% in the front and 60% in the rear. This is the basic distribution, then it can vary a little bit depending on the situations. This one will be the main petrol engine. All of the petrol engines will soon also be equipped then with those particle filters. And the same goes for the TDIs, of course, for the diesel side. You start with a 2 liter TDI, this one then has front wheel drive and only a 12 volt board net. All others, the V60 for the petrol and also the 3 liter TDIs, they come with a 48 volt board net, so more electrification, mild hybrid system that you can use this sailing or coasting function to sail, save some fuel and that of, of course also all the assistance systems can be powered. And about, about the horsepower figures then for the diesels, the 2 liter TDI will be with about 200 horsepower and the 3 liter TDI with 231 or 286 horsepower. And the last one, the 286 horsepower, will be the, the only one coming with the converter automatic gearbox or the other with the S-Tronic dual clutch transmission. One shot preview of night driving before we start with the really driving part because this is really so fancy, so cool. Look at how this car looks like when you drive it at night. Very well done with the um, illumination, with the ambient light. You can pick a lot of different colors for that um, as well. Then we have, for example, also the head-up display, which you can very well see at night. It can display different information. Also, those arrows, for example, where you have to go in the route. And also very spectacular, the uh, night vision feature, again an option um, that might be useful when you're really living somewhere where you don't have any exterior lighting available and you're driving a lot of time at night. And my favorite feature is definitely, definitely those, uh, you know, those matrix LED headlights. You know, this car always came with LED, but matrix LED with the high beam function, this is then optional. And you can see the spectacular effect when you're somewhere driving with light or maybe there's a car in front of you then this spot is left out so not all of those single leds are being activated but then when you come to a darker area bam here it is and then it it widens the the light view and you really think you are in a spaceship and everything is getting bright again so and overall the system tries to prevent anyone from getting blinded but you should have the optimum optimum view and i have to say i think i hardly ever had a nighttime ride where i could see so much so you know when you're living in a crowded area where also motorways may be illuminated and you're not driving so many times at night 
save the money, stick with the standard LED. But if you are really a nighttime driver, you, that often happens to you, or maybe in a Nordic country where it's often pretty dark, then those matrix LED lights will really help you. Also, you know, one of the technology highlights here for sure. This is the vehicle key. I think it also has a premium approach. But you can also use the key this entry function. Just put your hand right here to close the vehicle or put it inside the door handles to open it. And this one here is also equipped with the optional soft close. Magic. But you have to pay for it extra. Then inside here extreme clean design great build quality here with brushed aluminum style you can also have just a black style here for example so different choices alcantara at the inside of the doors then galvanized buttons with a clicking sound click click so that's always fun every single button not so much room here for bigger bottles just small bottles right there then the main part of the interior at the moment, you can see all the infotainment system monitors are shut off. I will soon show you how they look like turned on, but here in this way you can see how it's you know in the most clean sur surrounding with the S line package also inside. Flat bottom of the steering wheel is a very sporty approach. Single frame grille is mirrored on the inside of the steering wheel. I like when interior deals are picked up, basically then from exterior ones, and those seats. It's the same then with the suspensions here with the seats because you have four different types. Base seats, sports seats, sports plus seats, and both sports and sports plus are available here with this Alcantara frequency, it's, it's called. On the outside, they partly use leather red, partly real leather, um, but it's already a step forward in the higher trims. And then the optional one is a multi-contour seat. I showed you that in a static setup. So four seats available. And with those sports seats, you're really fine off because you have more shoulder support right here. And they are also available then with Alcantara. But you can also go with base seats, just with fabric, at least in Germany. Sitting inside, it is very spacious and that's also a difference for example to the a7 which we have also tested the a7 is a little bit flatter especially here in the a pillar and this one here gives you more headroom especially if you don't have the panoramic roof equipped you have plenty of headroom although i'm one meters 86 or six foot one you can also adjust the steering wheel in wow it's like <laughs> uh, i think i've never seen a steering wheel where, where you can adjust it really in this distance is really interesting. Um, those seats here, they have a manual control. You can put the front part of the seat a little bit higher if you like. You can make it a little bit longer. You can pump it up, y'all. I guess they've put the manual seat here that I can pump it up, y'all, for, for you, just, you know. And then this um, control knob to control the rear part of the seat, which is really hard to control and you're always damaging your watches. So um, I don't like this system. I think for a car of this price, every single seat from the base model should have the electric control. On the one hand, I'm fine when nothing is really, you know, not everything is electronically controlled, but seat-wise, it's also a safety feature when you're, for example, driving and think, oh, I need, you know, to change the angle in the rear, and then you just blip, blip, and then it's done. So I think it's really easier than the manual control here. Other than that, you have this typical luxury sedan seating position in the front. And the feeling that the interior gives you already here from the first seating test is that BMW and Mercedes feels a little bit more voluminous in the interior, where this one here is sleeker, cleaner. This is, however, nothing with just good or bad. It is indeed a personal preference, so you should also compare our other videos then from the 5 Series and the Mercedes E-Class.
this is the interior overview and definitely a wow effect. You know, I'm not too happy with the shiny black materials right there because they collect fingerprints and also scratches. Well, maybe you should just leave it then and always clean it. Then it looks also fancy. And I think they have found a very cool way here for this matte aluminum style. Also, just listen to it. Very haptical, interesting also um, the experience. Everything is streamlined. It has some Porsche style definitely with this strong wrapping right there. Then again, this compact steering wheel, good control. And the base setup will be analog instruments on the left. Optional, you can see here 12.3 inch digital cockpit, soon more deals to that. The base setup here would be 8 inch in the top and this one, the lower, 8.6 inch, always stays the same. And then optional, as we show you right here, 10.1 inch together with the MMI Navigation Plus that you get all the fancy, for example, also the satellite view. We'll soon dig deeper into the details of those screens right there. But let's just finish the base one. Here again with the single frame grill style, I think again picking up the exterior details and then the lower part with the big classic middle console. Here by the way with the S-Tronic automatic transmission, so this is then a dual clutch transmission and in the lower part you just don't have so many buttons anymore. Start stop and then a camera button for example to check out this really superb camera system with a great resolution and then just a volume button left that you can still manually control that. Digital instruments right there. I think they are best in class at the moment. You can also check out how fancy this full view of the map looks like, but you can also get other information in there, for example, and also, um, you know, radio info, consumption info, and so on. You're pretty flexible and uh, it definitely has a wow effect, but you can still get those analog instruments if you like. And you can control those digital instruments on the left side. You zoom in and out on the map, for example, change the view or go back or then change in the menu right there. And this is a clear view of the head-up display. It can also show more information as I've already shown you with this nighttime feature. Infotainment details. Um, interesting is that when you swipe in this menu and you press a button, for example, you also get a clicking sound and somewhat a haptical feedback, although it's just a screen. It looks great in this glass view and look how fast it is with this new CPU Unix they are, uh, they are using. So pretty impressive for sure. And when you want to enter an address, then you can also play together with the lower screen because then you can um, either use the voice input, for example, but you can also um, um, you know, put, the, put just the letters right there or then use a writing function um, this is actually quite handy when mm. you then can enter it in this way. Other than that, both screens are a little bit separated. For example, here in the top, you can also change the settings and the radio and also get the um, Apple CarPlay connection, for example, or you can still remain with your classic Bluetooth connection. And one very interesting feature of this camera, I want to show you the 3D view. This is um, an, you know, an imaginary picture of all the surround cameras. This one then is just, you know, um, a 3D projection basically, but from all those pictures of the cameras, an uh, image is being formed. And then you can, for example, check, oh, am I really damaging my alloys right and left? This is, of course, a very, very impressive thing. Wow, this is really wow, wow, wow. But you have to take some time to control all of this, so you shouldn't do that while driving faster. <laughs> And taking a look at the lower screen in detail here, you can control the climate ones. Um, I still prefer to have real knobs because, I mean, it's super fancy. Also gives you this haptical feedback. It looks superb. You can control where the vents are coming from right there. But while driving, it is definitely distracting. You cannot control it while driving without being distracted. And I think that's really dangerous. In the lower part, you also have a drive select, for example, to pick the you know, dynamic and sport mode and something like that. Um, soon more to that while we drive the car. Again, it looks great. And I have great ideas here, but you know, while yeah. driving, I think you yeah. need some you know, voice control or something. And um, I haven't managed to control the vent structure here, for example, where it's coming from via voice control. However, what you can do with the voice control to make it a little bit simpler and safer is, for example, adjust the temperature. So now it says, what can I do for you? 
change the temperature to 23 degrees. I'll increase the temperature to 23 degrees. Nice. So it's also 23 degrees now. Or you can also, for example, say, I am cold. What temperature should I set for you? 19 degrees. I'll lower the temperature to 19 degrees. Actually, the car should have said now, wait a minute, you first say I'm cold and then 19 degrees, I won't do that. <laughs> that would be, you know, appropriate answer of the vehicle. Um, but, you know, with changing the vent, for example, I've tried it, I can try it once more. Please change the vent. Could I you say that? Okay. You can operate. That's not really a... I'll be... Oh. Whoa. So, I mean, in some of the situations, you're really like a little bit overwhelmed. Then some, you know, some features are popping up, but you know, the ones that are really working properly, that is then totally fine. So I think it's already a step in the um, right direction. We have to see how that one plays out. Of course, it also helps really when, um, you know, searching for a destination or something. Drive me to Berlin. I'm looking for destinations for you. Please wait a moment. Yeah, so Please now so. Berlin appears here and I can just click it and go there. So that's also comes really handy. Adaptive cup holders in the front here, very well done. I like those, those are my favorite apex here basically. Then the room to put your key. Then electric handbrake here, very sleek design as well. Then this armrest, you can slide it forward a little bit, fixedly attached, superb build quality, the best you can find. And then you can flip it up and have two more USB supplies. Inductive charging platform, again, this almost nothing comes with standard equipment. You have to pay that extra. And of course, you can also put your phone right there. It um, does fit also. Sitting in the rear, yes, you have one centimeter longer leg room than in the previous generation. So it's a little bit more spacious. And you also have enough knee room here, even if the tall driver is sitting in the front. However, with those big luxury sedans, you always have the problem that the package, so considering the length on the exterior and the room you get on the interior, is really, really bad. So you, they are not using the length they have, but you still have enough room because the car is so super long. Headroom-wise, it's also totally fine. Good result, also better as for the A7, because there the roofline falls a little bit more. And when you go for the estate version here of the A6, it goes all the way like this, so you have more room than for your head but this one here is actually really enough already you feel a little bit cramped as you are in this lying seating position you also cannot really change the position so i can just stress again um, for me the times of the luxury sedans are over for uh, rear seat chauffeuring yes they look very classy on the exterior i have this classic approach but if you want the most um, you know luxury experience in the rear rather go for an SUV because then you have an upright seating position also in the rear. And you can flip those seats from here. Takes a little bit of effort. This is a one third, two third split from the general setup here. Um, when you lift the head restraints, you can also get the rear bench here a little bit flatter like this, that you have a transition. And you also have an armrest right there, like this with cup holders, adaptive and some room right there and then you can also just flip the middle part as a ski hatch and load through a lot of things and then you can get two usb supplies for the rear the 12 volt power supply and optional is four zone climate control where you can control the temperature in the rear even with the haptic feedback and the clicking sound so um, this is really nicely done but of course again a costly extra so let's open this trunk hatch and it opens basically automatically, but it's not an electric system. So you have to close it quite firmly that it really closes. So, and then you have 530 liters, quite square dimensions for a luxury sedan. Um, so it is somehow very well used, but of course the building form itself is limiting very much. So the estate is the way to go then if you want it more versatile. A net can be equipped right there to keep things held tight. Underneath that you have some sound equipment, great sound by the way from this optional sound system. Then when you put the cabin trolley inside, then you can check the dimensions. It's really long, that's for sure, but the height is limited. And then let's flip those seats. 
check how that one plays out. This one then is the one third. You can, as I said earlier, also have just this ski hatch in the middle here. Hey guys. And then finally, the last one and this one then is the maximum setup you have. Here on the left side, by the way, we push all the way down. And this is the difference when those head restraints are not put higher. Let's start the driving part, aka Thomas's driving lounge. And interesting, we have the dynamic all-wheel steering here. That means the tires on the rear axle can also move. And when we are going slowly, especially up to 5% across, you can really see it at the rear tire there, how they move a little bit left or a little bit right. It's really interesting to see and accounts for minus 1.1 meter turning circle of this vehicle when you're driving slowly and also the car feels more agile especially when driving at slower speeds when you are at higher speeds then it's not about the turning agility it's more about the stability and that is then up to two percent in the same direction steering like the front wheels that's the difference and so it is a cost, a costful option, but it is one that you should be going for if you have enough money and if you want to have an option which, you know, really gives you some technology advantage because it makes the car indeed feel more agile. Um, also, when I'm turning it out in those very tight corners, which is really fun to do, although the car is big. So usually I would say, you know, a car of that size is Mm, you know, at some point on some tight roads, not so much fun to drive, but this all-wheel steering really accounts for it that, you know, it fakes a shorter wheelbase. This is the, the driving feeling you get from this then, so this is pretty cool. As I said earlier, we also have the adaptive air suspension built in here. It is, you know, when you want to save money, you can stay with the base suspension, it will do fine. Uh, but if you're, wow, cool, this is a great view here on the River Douro that ultimately ends in Porto, in Portugal. So if you have the money, you should get the air suspension because it gives you this flying carpet riding comfort. Um, also, the non-air suspensions are really good at Audi, so you shouldn't be afraid to get also the base one. But then again, if you have a good budget for that, leasing or buying wise, the air suspension will give you more comfort and also more flexibility because at lower speeds, I can, you know, have the best comfort. It really feels like the car would be literally flying on the road. This is pretty cool. And at higher speeds, then I can still get some more stability because I can also pick it in a drive select. Um, you know, I can remain in auto mode, dynamic mode, comfort, efficiency or individual and I can also race or lower the car. So if I'm facing some bumps or maybe going slightly off-road, I can put the car a little bit higher and that's pretty cool. In the auto mode, the car decides itself what it's going to do with the dual clutch transmission, automatic gearbox. You can always use the shifting pedals here, it goes into manual mode, you can shift up again or hold the pedal to go back to the D mode. Besides the driving modes, you can also pull on the shifting lever, then you get in this S mode, but this, just for shifting, the gears are turned up higher, shifting later, and shifting down earlier again. This is automatically happening when you go to the dynamic mode of the vehicle, and I can do it right now as well. So when I'm in this dynamic mode, I can also see that the suspension is going down. I have more contact to the road, car feels stiffer, the steering gets a little bit more precise and you know a little bit more resistance from it and the gears are then automatically in this S mode and it gets some more boost from the engine then as well. So um, that air suspension really makes you very flexible and for example the sport mode is good that you can do some overtaking maneuver here quite quickly. Thank you so much that was really nice. So you can get more power from that engine without you know, shifting down. But then again, you can also just stay in the normal driving mode and use the pedals right there. And here again, those corners are actually for a big luxury sedan rather tight. But then again, 
this great suspension together with the progressive steering they've worked on. This was one of the factors they've improved now. Um, so you see, I can keep my hands on the steering wheel all the time. I don't have to steer much. So the angle of the corner is pretty much like the angle of the steering wheel. And that to me is one of the most important factors when driving the car. And that is one thing um, I feel sometimes that is lacking, especially in base Mercedes models, if you compare them to, to that. Mm, maybe it gives you a little bit more natural steering feeling because some criticize with Audi that it would be too artificial. Um, but then again, at Mercedes you have to steer much more. So with the base Mercedes E-Class, for example, I wouldn't really have fun here in those corners. Um, I would have to steer, you know, maybe this angle more each corner to the, to the right and the left. Um, with the BMW, they have something in between. They give you a very natural steering feeling, but you don't have to turn that much um, like with Mercedes. So it's really like, you know, from, from step to step how those three premium manufacturers behave also in steering-wise. It's also a very interesting finding when you really drive all three direct competitors. So let's see if we can overtake this truck then in front of us. And this also accounts for the feeling that this cuff doesn't feel too big. It is really big, but for example also the E-Class and the BMW 5 Series they feel bigger when driving. I mean, they use um, a lot of aluminum here also to keep the, um, uh, the weight down. Here we go. And how effortless this vehicle does that. Wow, that's really cool. Here also in the corner, good contact to the road again, good feedback from the car. So um, aluminum, for example, used at the hood the doors to keep the weight down but nowadays you know BMW 7 series and 5 series they introduced this um, uh, also a lot of you know aluminum loose used the 7 series even carbon fiber so they you know a lot of years Audi was the only aluminum low weight car in this segment um, now others have catch up there as well so Yes, it is a relaxed feeling and it is also a sporty feeling and we're not in the you know, S8, S6 or something. Um, so this is still somewhat the base model with this petrol engine and I don't have the feeling it should be any, you know, any sportier. So with, for example, the Mercedes E-Class, you have the base E-Class, which is pretty, you know, lax luxury wise. So um, not sporty at all. And then you got to get a E43 to get it sporty and with BMW and Audi both they are also the base models uh, drive pretty funny and, and, and sporty well they don't drive funny they drive in a fun way or in a fun sport fun sporty way that's more precise so that's about you know steering the uh, the car yourself however if you think about upper mid-size segment which is this one here and mid-size segment which would be a4 C-Class uh, and uh, BMW 3 Series, those mid-size cars of course give you more driving fun because they do feel lighter. So at some point, you, whoa, that's a bump, <laughs> but for such a fierce bump, the suspension still handled that very well, I have to say. Um, so if you go for the mid-size segment, you have more driving fun, the car feels lighter, you can't deny physics, then at some point this weight does play a role for sure. And, you know, getting back to the aspect when I want to change the temperature, yeah, I can, some, but I always have to look, you know, or you have to do trial and error. So, temperature you can set with the voice command, but sometimes I don't feel like talking to the car all the time. Maybe if I enter a destination mode, like, you know, drive me to Barcelona or whatever. But then, hmm, I'm somehow missing those, those turning knobs, you know. Or maybe, you know, it has to be somewhere where you can uh, click it a little bit easier. Then. So that's one, one downside of this infotainment uh, system for sure. Other than that, you can also at daytime very clearly read what's happening in those, uh, you know, on those three displays. That's pretty cool. And again, um, I'm, you know, driving those bending corners here all the time and I'm not getting any fatigue, for example. Um, and sometimes with bigger cars you say, you know, great luxury, awesome vehicle, but mm, getting a little bit, 
too stressful in, in winding corners and here it's actually no problem. Those 20 inch rims by the way get some more comfort if you go a little bit smaller. They're still somewhat okay especially in combination with the air suspension but if you do not pick the air suspension do yourself the favor and get some more comfort by not going 20 inch rims. Um, maybe go you know 17 could look a little bit small for people who really love to check the you know the relation of rims and cars 18 or 19 would be my tip for you to go for that's uh, I think a good compromise between looks and then also the the driving comfort because the bigger the rim the less the comfort the, the more the sporty feeling yes but uh, the bumps are more transported than to the uh, to the car because you have less uh, tire area left so I think driving wise from the whole setup they they've done a really great job so as for consumption you know as I told you earlier either you're all using this mild hybrid technology so when I'm for example going to this efficiency mode I'm boosting that even more so um, for example now when I'm uh, going off the throttle and um, the car is just rolling then you know there's hardly any resistance for the engine the rolling effect of the car is being used and depending on you know let's see if it maybe also has to do with the AC sometimes it can be you know depending on how much consumers you have in the car like those electric consumers so um, for example yesterday I was also on the motorway and then I was seeing how the RPMs dropped to zero especially in the efficiency mode and then the car was really fully sailing and uh, basically using not using any fuel and so on motorway with constant speed and stuff I could get this car to about 9 liters on 100 kilometers and that is actually pretty decent consumption for such a big vehicle of your of course you can um, get that higher when you have this agile variety for example uh, here now you know in those bending corners acceleration braking acceleration braking we are here, here about 13 and a half liters on 100 kilometers uh, for the MPG just Google 13 liter or 13 L slash 100 km in MPG for the you know the performance consumption and for the minimum consumption then 9 L slash 100 km in MPG so yes you can drive it fuel consuming but then again you see uh, when you push it hmm, it goes really uh, way up high and so the, the sailing coasting function with the 48 volt board net mild hybrid technology is something that works when you really plan it and use it in the most efficient way and uh, on paper in, in the laboratory basically and on the motorway that is then somehow working but other than that um, yeah you know not really always those cobblestones area here wow the air suspension is also evening that out very very well that's that's pretty fancy really cool so the, the good thing to me is that you can still drive this car on your own it's not only um, an autonomous driving machine although it is surely capable of doing so um, you know, we have the autonomous emergency brake which is starting from standard equipment most important feature then optional blind spot monitor this area here is flashing when someone is overtaking you this is the most important assistance system option third most important is the adaptive cruise control which is really giving you a comfort feature also now in different trims available they put it together in some assistance systems packages and then you can get this for example, a tool package and so on and the ACC also available then with a traffic jam assistant that you can basically let the car drive and don't do anything yourself at very low speeds that's very comfortable and then everything else is of course nice to have let's take it that way uh, in corners like those here where you have a lot of fun driving you don't want um, too much to do with it but when you're on the motorway for example that's pretty cool 
when you can also have this steering assist the car could theoretically drive on its own but after a while it says please put your hands on the steering wheel but you can feel definitely that the car is steering yourself and I found this system a better approach than Mercedes does because with Mercedes we recently experienced in the A class and in the G class that those corrections when you were going you know closer to the lines were done by the brakes and then you're suddenly like bam not with the steering wheel but just like, oh my god you everyone is now shaking in the car because the car is then reducing speed at the inside wheels to get the car off on the road again here it's just slightly done with the steering correction by the car itself that's a smoother transition however i always turn it off here with the button with this column here i always turn it off basically uh, when I want to steer myself because you get a very loose steering feel when you have it activated and you're still you know, steering actively yourself. It's good when you want to relax on the motorway, keep your hands on the steering wheel and then let the car basically do its own job with you a little bit, you know, surveying it. And of course, oh, you always have to, have to be aware of uh, uh, what's really happening. But pretty impressive, uh, definitely how all the systems are working all the radar systems that are built in here in the car in this car and also safety wise and that you get then also the warning when you set the turning indicator and want to overtake for example the 3d camera systems we've shown you earlier and, and stuff so that's um you know that, that's also putting input then in this cpu unit called zfast developed by nvidia and it's really a driving computer, basically, this car. Of course, at some point you can say over-engineered, but as I've driven the A8, the A7, and the A6 now, you're getting used to it a little bit. So as I was first driving the A8, and for the very first time, and I was like, oh, wow, that's really, it's too much, too much at once. But then you're getting used, it, used to it, and then it's also, you know, quite okay. But then again, you also do not have to order every option they have available because this is also one of the biggest downside of this car it can get so extremely expensive and the extra price policy is sometimes yeah I will really have to say pathetic because you have to pay for everything extra and sometimes also extremely high prices just for some very very small things so maybe if they they are a little bit more successful they could also get give something back to the customer there and include some more features then as an advantage. I think a lot of people would be um, glad for that and maybe also honor that then. So I'm still not getting you know any, any fatigue here. That's pretty cool. So also long-term comfort with those sport seats are given. By the way, I said earlier, base seat, sport seat, super sport seat, multi-contour seat. The super sport seat is not out yet, it will come later and then you also see the different differentiation to this normal sport seat here and the super sport seat that it has the integrated head restraint. This one here has a separated head restraint but I recommend you to stick with those sport seats here because the super sport seats will uh, have you know less room to move around and you will not use this car on the racetrack. So this sport seat here gives you a good compromise between a little bit more shoulder support. So here I'm being kept tight in those corners don't slide around too much also good that I have the Alcantara if you would here then again have the full animal skin seat I would slide around all the time that's also one thing you have to um, keep in mind even if you don't care about the animals it's better to be kept tight a little bit more in the seat especially um, you know in those in those um, bending turns so overall I think also satisfied with those sports seats Mm, at some point I would of course be interested also in the base seat. I'm always very interested in how cars really look like in the base variant. Unfortunately we do not always have the chance to do so because the manufacturers always want to present you know, everything they have that no journalist later says, wait a minute, that's an entertainment system is too small. Yeah, because maybe there's a bigger one optional. So they put everything they have in there that no one can complain. And so I also can have a very differentiated opinion about those uh, manual seats. As I said earlier, I like it when not everything is electric. However, electric seats, I found them quite cool. But then the important information is they are not missing in this vehicle. 
it's just an option again to have electric seats and you just have to know that and then decide if it's really important to you if you want to pay that money for, for this kind of stuff. Yeah, so pretty impressive and I think the driving part is definitely the one where this car here can score one of the best results, you know, besides the consumption again, but that's also pretty common in, in the segment here. However, I'm really astonished that the difference between, you know, the minimum and the maximum consumption is really high for though that's quite often with very small turbo engines but I'm, I'm, I'm really um, surprised that we also have that here with a with a very big vehicle with big displacement still 3 liter v6 usually they are not that sensitive in the differentiation um, or in, in, in the difference between the, the minimum and the maximum consumption so again 9 liters minimum 13 something more maximum and the realistic everyday driving figure will usually be then somewhere in between, so around 11, which then would be somewhat okay. And then the question, if, if that one justifies the extra price for the diesel, um, that really depends on how many kilometers a year you are driving. And of course, I want to show you some motorway driving. At the moment I'm in the dynamic mode, so I can also show you some more of the acceleration and also about cell insulation and some of the assistant systems. So let's go down here. Soon there will also be more speed allowed as soon as we approach the next one. Here I can also activate the adaptive cruise control. The distance to the car in front of me is being kept, as you can see. The car is breaking, the, um, breaking, not breaking down, <laughs> and also reacting on the speed limit. So now it was 40 kilometers an hour, and the adaptive cruise control reads the traffic signs. You can get this trim of the ACC, but you do not have to, so you can pick that one. But if you have it, then it's always there. And now let's accelerate. Let's do some. Uh, let's do some 70 to 120 kilometers. was already 125. So you can see really good performance here from the 3 liter V6. The sound is not too loud, so it's rather subtle. And I mean, if you're driving an A6, you also do not want to show off. So I, I think that's also a perfectly fine decision-wise then. So now the cruise control, you can set it here at the column next to the steering wheel. And I also have possibility then to deactivate or activate the lane guidance. So if I want to drive a little bit sporty or maybe just do the acceleration and braking part with the ACC but steer my own, that's fine. But I can also activate it and then the car is really helping me to keep the lane. So this is not a system where you should take your hands off the steering wheel, just I'm demonstrating you that the car is being kept in the lane and that works very accurately. So um, now it's already warning me, please uh, take over the steering wheel. I get the small warning sign. So that, that goes quite quickly then that you have to take over. So usually you keep at the steering wheel and now I get some help from the steering that I'm being kept in the lane. And as I said earlier, when I'm really actively steering myself, especially on winding motorway roads, it's somehow better to deactivate it. If it's more running straight and it's getting rather boring, then it can be also relaxing to have it activated. But um, all of those systems are really, really working uh, pretty flawlessly, so that's, that's really cool. Sound insulation wise, you hear nothing. So the sound insulation is definitely on a top-notch level. There is this optional sound insulation package, so the base one is already good. Then you can always put it on the next level and even increase the noise insulation, which is the case with this vehicle here. And when you're driving about 120 kilometers an hour, so over 60 miles an hour, 60, 60, 70 miles an hour, you hear nothing. It would be almost like standing still. 
So the only wind sounds you probably hear is when you have turned the AC up in a you know level four vent or level five or something. But that's basically it, and this is uh, definitely very impressive. However, all of the competitors they managed to do that very well. I think Mercedes with the E-Class is at the moment leading in the respect of the noise insulation. So the E-Class to me was the most silent one. And sound system wise, this Bang & Olufsen sound system here, I've seen it earlier with this pretty spectacular popping up effect when the speaker in the front there goes up. It's really a very decent sound. I think the um, 3D surround in the Mercedes E-Class is in this case also a little notch better. So it's really interesting how of those three premium manufacturers I've mentioned so many different elements now. You know, in this field Audi is a little bit better, in that field Mercedes is a little bit better, in that field BMW is a little bit better and it, it's really more about which one of those special features is the most important to you and then it could be your final choice, choice of you know which which one to go for for those. So pretty relaxing ride here on the motorway. Definitely a great autobahn vehicle. And if you're driving the estate or the sedan, it will not matter really very much driving-wise. Of course, at a later stage, we'll also take another in-depth look at the estate, which is especially popular in Germany because Germans like to load stuff then in those uh, estate wagon trunks and right there. And yeah, I have to say, you know, you always have the possibility to throw a bicycle in there, which is not possible in the sedan here. But driving wise, there's usually not much of a difference, in, you know, how, the, how they really behave or if they're sport here or something. Weight wise, it's also not much of a difference. So um, that's usually the same then. So I can really enjoy this autobahn ride. And this car is basically autonomous ready, but the regulations have to come first for that. And we've also seen recently that there are also some accidents when people trust too much in autonomous drive systems. So I think uh, it will take some more years until we have this transition phase finished for that. So what do you think about this tech fest here today in the vehicle? Well, if you compare it to the A7 and the A8, yes, the A7 is the sportier approach, the A8 is the long approach, the big luxury chauffeur approach. This one here, the very classic approach, as I've told you, and it is rather an evolution in design, so nothing super spectacular, but it is very sharply designed. And there will, of course, also be the estate if you want to have some more room on the interior. The interior is so precise, they have perfection in detail. The infotainment system, yeah, I think among the three German premium manufacturers, I think it is the best solution. However, you can always say that's maybe a little bit over-engineered and they have, you know, they have to try to find some more solutions that it's easier to control, although you have so many controls available. Also good that we have Alcantara seats available even here in the high luxury segment. Driving wise, it was very, very good, I can tell you, um, daytime and nighttime. So this car here, already in the base version, really masters the compromise between sportiness and the luxury comfort very well. And to me, even a little bit more than its premium competitors. The BMW 5 Series in the new generation, the famous German 5 BMW, here in the M Performance version, the so-called M550i. We will explain you everything about it. What is the difference to the true M version? What is the difference to the base 5 Series model? If you haven't seen our reviews so far, everything on exterior, interior and the driving performance with this 8-cylinder. And we will solve the riddle if the 5 Series runs over this paper bag when the car is remotely controlled.
special Autobahn feature. Let's go! That was 90 to 150. Went pretty fast, didn't it? Sport mode means we hear more from the exhaust. Also use the shifting pedals if you want to start in a lower gear. This is the M5, M4. This is 200. Well, feels like nothing. Also, I don't have to raise my voice that much. Wow. And the car is super stable also, so it's just an easy exercise for the 5 Series in general and of course with this almost biggest engine you can get. Really flawless in the performance. I think we didn't expect otherwise. It's a nice rolling sound, isn't it? What do you think about the sound here in the inside? Fourth gear at the moment. <laughs> and you're just driving 170, for example, kilometers an hour. Like it is absolutely nothing. So this calmness and sovereignty about this car is, I think, what is um, uh, really, really defining the essence, for sure. So, and soon we also get to another motorway and then we can also tell you something more about the driving dynamics. Lane change here. Also fun to use the shifting pedals. It's a really low frequency sound. It's really um, been a long time since we, I mean, we had several sports cars and stuff, but really get this low frequency sound there. So we hold the right shifting pedal to go in the D mode again. Then you see everything calms down. Soon, also later in the longer driving part, we'll tell you more about calm driving and assistance systems and smooth autobahn ride, but this one was just a sneak preview of the performance because this is what the engine is about. The front of the new 5 Series generation is characterized by this very huge double kidney, the BMW Doppelniere in German, and also that it goes through the headlights basically, so it slides over. Before it was really separated, now it really forms one unit and that is stressing the width of this very vehicle. The M550i is a little bit similar if you go for a M Sport package for the normal 5 Series. And that means bigger air intakes, a stronger lower bumper. The car also sits a little bit lower. And also you can see around the double kidney and some other essence, you can see this matte gray styling. Those headlights come with LED technology those ones you can see right now are the Super LED. They are called Select Beam at BMW and they have a range of 500 meters then in this top spec. Here again the matte gray signature color of the 550i and inside the double kidney you can see those vertical fins and the inside fins they're closed at the moment to reduce the wind resistance. As soon as the engine needs more cooling then they open and leave more air through. 4 meters 94 or 16 foot 2 is the total length of this 5 series. By the way, the two-ring version, the estate that we will also soon show you in the full review, will have the very same length. The M550i has some special features. First of all, again, matte gray contrast, for example, the mirror caps or also the alloys. Those are the 20-inch at the moment. 19-inch would be standard and I think 
especially in the combination with the Mediterranean blue color here. Such a beautiful combination. Or what do you think? Want to hear your comments on that. By the way, this one here reduces the wind turbulences inside the wheel arch. So this really goes through. The wind comes in here and then goes out there. So interesting feature. Overall, the layout is rather conservative. In this upper mid-size segment, customers do not want so drastic changes. So BMW, I think, took the right decision not to change too much, even if um, some may be, may be a little bit disappointed. But you've seen throughout the generations, most of the times, maybe one or two generations at an exception, it has really been an evolution than a revolution. So classic sedan shape here and also not too drastic design lines we can see. What do you think about design, especially with this M550i look? And finally to the rear, which is the most subtle part of this vehicle. You can just see a small integrated wing here, but I think it's also good that it's not, you know, too much screaming for attention. This is also different to a true M version to the top, 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 top sports version. So this one here, one below. This one here can also be, you know, more suitable for everyday driving life, also visually. M550i logo we can see right there. And the exhaust, the outer part is just a cover part and the inner part, well, you can see four pipes in total. And you can also see an X-Drive logo because this one here always coming with an all-wheel drive with a rear wheel bias. However, the rear wheel steering is not available for this 550i version. They wanted to keep it, let's say, rather pure. And that the car sits 10 millimeters lower with the M Sports suspension. You can't really see it, but I'm telling you, it's the case. <laughs> A normal 5 Series, German prices 45,000 euros. This one here, 83, almost double the price, including VAT, Mehrwertsteuer. So, comes close to the US prices if you add the VAT then. And the main reason for that is this engine 4.4 liter, 8 cylinders, 462 horsepower, with a beautiful M performance work. To 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour, the car takes four seconds. And then the question is, what do you need a real M version for when it's already that powerful? Well, yeah, I mean, it's that powerful as pass through M version. And what is the logic, logic here? Mercedes, for example, has E63 and E43. Audi has RS and S. And so BMW has the M and M performance. So always comes with the visual parts and then always a very powerful engine but not the most powerful one and of course for most drivers this one will be more than enough power as i've already told you and then there are also more engines available of course for the four uh, five, <laughs> five series for the four series of course as well but for five series four cylinder six cylinder and here eight cylinder only for the seven series you get a 12 cylinder and there are also the new plug-in hybrid version 530e, which we've recently featured with a new inductive charging platform. Also interesting concept if you have the possibility to charge. This one here, the performance of the petrol turbo engine, we will soon test also on the German Autobahn. So you can get this huge key with the display and with the optional feature that you have the remote parking function. And I always wanted to test that. You can see there's a digital screen. You can unlock it and, for example, get uh, info about the range or um, you can preheat or pre-cool the car. And this one here is the function for the remote parking. And a very interesting but yet scary feature for sure. And then you have to, have to hold the right button at the side and press engine start and magic <laughs> the car starts and this for example makes sense let's say i have a very narrow parking garage and this is so narrow that i can't get out when the vehicle is inside then i can then slide with my finger on the key
So I remove the car backwards. As soon as I remove my finger, the car stops. Or forward. And you see again, when I remove my finger, the car stops. Now what is interesting now, I want to test. Let's say I fail in doing something with the car remotely. And maybe I hit an obstacle. So let's try this plastic bag here. Uh, sorry, paper bag. Not plastic, we're going all paper today. And I put it in front of the car. And so if we run this over, this uh, you know won't be any problem. The question is, will the car stop itself when I'm too dumb to use it? So I'm again activating the remote parking function. I hold this parking key and the engine start. <laughs> it's just funny that the engine is starting remotely from the outside. So and now ta -da, it gets really interesting. What will the car do if I'm too dumb to use it? Okay, it will run over the back. And well, this one is the <laughs> risk of this function, obviously as shown. Um, maybe it's different when the obstacle is higher, but this obstacle, I mean, there are such obstacles also maybe inside your garage. So be aware, it's a very useful function, but you really have to take care that you don't run the car too far inside your garage. And interesting, I did it the second time now, second try, and now, the car does not want to move forward anymore. No? So the car stopped actually. So this time obviously the car realized it. Let's go back again and forward again. Let's see? Now for the third time. Ah! Nicely done. Good boy. Good boy. So it can do it. Obviously the system is not, you know, flawless. But we wouldn't be good journalists if we didn't try it a second time and gave the car another chance. So let's head to the interior, solid door handles and a very solid door closing sound. And what is interesting in general with the 5 Series, they have improved the build quality which was criticized with a lot of BMW models here, they have really stepped up the game. Interesting surfaces here, especially for the M55i. Um, you can also feel the structure, very interesting also from the, um, you know, from the visual part but also from the haptical part and all the areas here in the top are also softened up you can touch them and squeeze them basically and they're really soft it's no hard plastic um, the only hard plastic well even here it's a little bit soft it's a little bit harder but softened up a little bit so very good impression from the build quality seat wise it's too bad i mean the color combination is nice but it's too bad because the standard seats for the m 550i and also for the M Sports package are called Rombical Alcantara Mix. Those are sports seats and which have fabric on the inside and on the outside are some Alcantara, the really great seats. I would like to show you them at some point. Today BMW choose again the full animal skin package because they still think that journalists expect that which some of them don't anymore. 
However, from the handcraft itself, you see it's also good quality and you have um, very good seat functions. A lot of elements you really have to learn that lumbar support, for example, then you can um, also lengthen the seating area uh, here, normal seat, then the seating area in the front for tall people, you can put that. Then there's the M steering wheel. You see here the logo, and it is, looks a little bit deformed, so because it's a little bit thicker on the top part, but it's good to ride with it, also with the heated steering wheel function. And you see those special structures, the aluminum checkered structures, also in the rest of the interior. And you can really compare it with uh, you going for an M Sports package in the interior, which I would also recommend, because going with the M Sports package in the interior, in general, for any version, is also a possibility to get those great fabric Alcantara seats I am recommending to you. They offer you greater grip, especially when you're driving faster and also good climate comfort. And speaking of climate comfort, you get the four zone AC also from standard equipment here. If you flash the ignition, by the way, seating position is in general very comfortable. One meters 86 or six foot one is my height and see I have still some headroom left. It's a classic sedan seating position, that's for sure. And you have this big automatic gear lever switch here. Converter gearbox, always for the most BMW vehicles, just very few with the dual clutch transmission. Then you, you can see here also more in close of you also have this very high class structures here. I really like it how they designed it. It's um, something unique for sure also here and it also feels very good. And then also on top of it again softened up here. So this layout, what they have done here, they have turn it a little bit towards the driver as we see in a lot of BMW um, vehicles. It also resembles front grille basically and then you can see that design of the screen that is the top one that is available also a smaller one it starts with this one here mirrors the lower function so it forms one total unit. Soon more details to the instruments. Again, maybe from this perspective you can see that the steering wheel is not really symmetrical. Um, that's more, you know, suitable for driving, not really visually wise, very attractive. And what is also very interesting in the interior is this climate unit. Um, everything will be activated when I start the car. Here you can see the glass screen where you can use the vents function however temperature still with a separate knob and also feels very good then there's still a cd or dvd player also with some hotkeys you can um, use also for the infotainment system below uh, above for example if i press five you can individually set that this one is at the moment set for the for the sports display so you can see you can turn up the new meters <laughs> really funny function and you see the horizontal layout for the infotainment screen in this app view sometimes I think it's a little bit too complicated um, in general I think the map of the GPS is very clear I like that that works pretty well also the reaction times um, but sometimes you need too too much time to get to certain menus. You can connect your phone via Bluetooth or also with Apple CarPlay and stuff, the smartphone mirroring function. And that is also working basically with, you can see, Bluetooth audio or screen mirroring. And the screen mirror would also work with the wireless charging. So you can indeed, if I just take the key as an example now, because this one is also inductively charged here, then the blue light flashes and you can put your smartphone here use the inductive charging and also then wireless carplay for example so both is wirelessly possible the charging and the connection to the screen however bluetooth also works if you have a very good and extensive car uh, infotainment system of course you do browse the infotainment system like this or this and stuff or use the hotkeys but for the first time you can also use this screen as a touch screen. So this one is new and especially good for the 
co-driver, for example, to check the weather forecast and some more without, you know, using the sometimes little bit complicated button there. But for the driver, of course, it's better to use it, especially while driving, because you cannot hold onto a touchscreen that well while driving. And next to the gear lever, you can find the driving modes, Sport, Comfort, Eco Pro and Adaptive. So you can change it if you want to have a more sporty input, for example, to the throttle and stuff. And also activate the camera system. And here we go. For example, this one would be the rear view camera. However, you can also switch it around, have this 360 degree view. What is that? Because we have the driver door open at the moment then you can see it's not working totally and the reason for that is or well, it's the proof that the side cameras are inside the mirrors and that's the reason they only work when the doors are closed you can see when I open the other door it's also the case and I close it again here we go and overall good resolution you can work very well with it also protect your alloys against damages it's really interesting what they've done with the instruments because on the one hand you can really feel those like real world features, those frames, but everything else is digital, speed and RPM and stuff. And you can see that when I turn off the engine, there they disappear then, step by step. So wireless connecting and charging possible, but what about USB? Well, under the armrest with a nice folding mechanism, there's just one USB charging slot. Hmm, it's a little bit disappointing, isn't it? So what about the rear compartment? I mean, it's a very long car, but for a long car, you know, there's just standard knee room. There is some knee room left, with me again, 186 in meters or 6 foot 1. But we have cars which are maybe in the small car segment, which have the same knee space. Then headroom, still given. Of course, the touring version will continue a little bit further on, but that's um, that's still okay. They've improved this also if you compare it to the previous generation. To flip the seats, we have to go to the trunk later on, but what we can do here is flip out those cup holders. And there's also a ski hatch we can flip from here. So we can reach through the trunk. And what's also interesting, Isofix is on the lower part of the seats, on two outside seats, and there are also top tethers on the outside seats each. And I've already mentioned the four zone AC comes with this 550i. And we can see it right here with the knobs we can also see in the front. It's just not um, just no um, uh, gauges here at the moment because the car is turned off. Uh, this is happening quite a lot. It's just working everything when the car is really running with the engine. In some cars it's enough to turn off, turn on the ignition, but here obviously they want to save some battery time as long as the engine is not running. So that one good thing here is that you have a long loading area. <laughs> it's really <laughs> long, but then just, you know, a hole to put things in there. This will be better with the touring version. We've already shown that on the motor show. This one here, more about style, elegance. Then, if you want more versatility, you have to go for the estate. You can also flip the seats. You have to release them from here. In the touring, they will also flip automatically. Here, you have to go around and then flip the seats manually here. And you have this two-third, one-third split, or also with the ski hatch I've shown you earlier. And here we go, so you can still have some more flexibility. About child safety here, let's test that. Yeah, I've did two or three times, sometimes it's too hard. That one, yeah, that was, that's quite okay. So from three times now, I've tested it once, it was a little bit too hard, but now it works. I think they've found a quite good solution. Some manufacturers did not. They have too much torque there. And um, for example, best at the moment at Mercedes. They have a really sensitive, but still always closes. It's of course a question if you have this small hatch, if it's really necessary to have the electric function. But I mean, why not have this luxury feature then?
welcome to the driving part, the discipline that suits the five series the most. And indeed, this is also the big difference with the other cars in this segment. They maybe have something this car doesn't, but driving wise, it's really always on top of the game. And already from the standard versions, of course. With the E-Class, for example, you rather have it that the base models are very soft, very just comfortable orientated. And then, for example, E43 could be compared. But with the BMW 5 Series, they concentrate on the sporty ride from the base model on. Here with the M Sport suspension, really have a little firmer ride, but it's quite okay, you know? It's it's not too rough. It's not that you say you don't want to ride this car in everyday driving life. This one here still feels good just when you're doing your normal stuff, you're commuting to work and um, I think that's also very important. And also when you let the car just roll, maybe take a look at the head-up display, which I see very clearly now. They have reworked it all also for the new generation. Then you can just relax. The engine is also relatively silent if you're just in normal driving mode and you have a big sovereignty with this huge displacement you have too. And this is a very relaxing ride. Also, as for the suspension in general, they do not offer air suspension for the sedan on purpose, they say. Air suspension is coming with the Touring, with the Estate, for the rear. Excellent. Here they said, you know, we are perfectly fine without the air suspension because an air suspension is maybe also not the sportiest decision and it really works very well. And um, the ride is that smooth at the same time, you could easily say, you know, it is one, but it's not. So getting on the first motorway, normal mode still, good side handling. Now you heard the eight cylinder for the very first time, but such a smooth evolvement of the power we have here. And we're driving 100, and wow, how silent it is in here. So very relaxing and calm once more. Driving 100 with this vehicle is like driving 160 with another normal vehicle. Wow. Um, sorry. It's the other way around, of course. 160 with this vehicle is like 100 with a normal vehicle. You know, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, so you were starting to wonder, of course. So reading, then when you drive like this now at 100, we're in the middle of four-lane motorway here. It's really noisy around here usually, but it's so silent. So um, they've really done a great job here. And, um, you know, getting in line with the E-Class, which is to me the most silent vehicle with the optional acoustic pack but yeah you can really argue is it maybe as silent really hard to tell you have to maybe then drive same situations um, directly after each other so that's that's really working perfectly also a lot of assistance systems on board here for example you got the normal adaptive cruise control you set the speed Speed is being maintained. What is this guy doing here? Okay. It's always a little bit strange when people overtake and then don't drive faster and get slower again. So, um, electric cruise control, speed is being maintained. It's working really flawlessly. Um, as for the autonomous driving functions, um, we've tested that already. Mercedes is a little bit more on top of the game there, and also the Tesla drives. Um, so they're not really the experts on the autonomous, uh, totally autonomous drive yet. But mainly you buy a BMW to drive it yourself, of course. More and more features are evolving. And we'll have to see how that works then. So we're switching to another motorway. Now we get a little bit rougher tarmac here for a short while and you also hear the sound differences. Setting the cruise control to 120. So let's see where the brakes when we go from 120 to 100. 
great performance of the brakes, even just a heavy hammering very slightly. Of course, you do feel the weight of the car. Also, when you're in the corners, it's not like a compact or, in a, or a mid-size car. So at some point, yes, you can make a big luxury sedan sporty, that is possible, but you cannot defy the odds of physics, you know. So it's still there, the, the weight is there and you do feel it and there's nothing you can really do about it at, you know, at a certain size. I think it's this solution also won't be solved because when we get uh, battery electric vehicles or CS and a Tesla Model S, they are even heavier, the vehicle itself. So, now we're getting in some traffic before we're searching a motorway spot where we can hammer the throttle a little bit more. This is also helpful to see what about the overview of this vehicle. I can watch quite well through the main mirror, although with the touring will be better because I have better visibility in height there. Through the sides, well, the windows are rather upright, so it's also not a problem. Um, it's, it's a relatively big car, but still you have a good feeling for it where it's ending. And then you also have the camera system. So I've driven bigger sedans which have uh, worse visibility. I think because of the conservative layout and they didn't play too much with the design, you also keep the visibility on the inside then. Talking about the driving modes, um, there's also this Eco Pro where all of the instruments go blue then. And with the Eco Pro, you can activate those sailing or coasting functions that you leave the throttle and let the car just roll. Also, the throttle input is reduced that you have less consumption. If you're just rolling here on the motorway, you see consumption is at the moment in 11.6 liters. If you're more driving city and really hammering throttle and stuff, that can be higher then. We'll see how it evolves during our test ride here. So, here again the adaptive cruise control. The funny thing is that I also have a visualization of that in the head-up display, drawing another vehicle that is active at the moment, so um, it's doing pretty well. Also, let's see how the car is. So I can activate this lane keeping mechanism so that is basically one part of this autonomous drive of course the vehicle says i should take my hands on the steering wheel as it's not meant to be in totally autonomous function yet as soon as i do it the vehicle does not complain anymore so again regulations are not that far yet for that then there's also the sport mode everything turns red and this gives us a probability just to hammer the throttle once more, 82, 120 already now. And you see also or heard that the characteristic of the sound changed. And that is a really a massive change. Maybe you've heard it already from the outside. When I started the vehicle with the sound test, I first activated the normal mode. And then I went to the sport mode. And then Maybe the throttle, maybe you heard the, the slight change then there. So the sport mode gives you this growling from the A cylinder. Also, you see that the RPMs go higher as the car is shifting up later and shifting down earlier. So I'm not sure if you want to drive like this all the time. It's more relaxing in the other modes, but this one here, if you want to do some overtaking maneuvers, if you feel like being somewhere having nice curvy roads where you say, yeah, I really want to uh, hammer it now just for fun, then of course it can make sense to have this sport mode always in control. This is now also an immediate response I have always, so there's no lag or, or whatsoever that gives you the pure performance always when you want it. So I have to see here at the moment those stuff there in, in, in the top part. Some of there are speed cameras inside those buildings. And then you have to watch it, you don't get any speeding tickets, especially not when you're on the way with a test vehicle. <laughs> so and then let's see, go to the comfort mode. Okay. 
sense any difference in the suspension. Yeah, especially going over some small bumps now. It is a little bit stiffer indeed. So also suspension wise, with a little difference. Also the steering wheel feels a little bit harder, gives you more resistance. Let's go to the comfort mode again. In general, um, the steering is not too progressive. It uh, feels rather natural. So um, if you're not into those totally arcade style steering wheel, this is also something for you. So you have some play in it. But also when you're um, doing some slalom tests, this vehicle doesn't let you down in the sportiness. So you always have a good contact to the road, a good feeling for the car. If you ask me if there's a huge difference to the generation before, mm, I think rather not. A little bit, of course. Even a little bit more agile. They saved some weight with the new generation of this vehicle, for example. Um, that definitely helped too. But of course, it's not a huge change. What was interesting was this rear axle steering I had last time in the 530D. That was really helping to get the car more agile. They did not put it here to probably get a more pure, sporty experience. Um, but then again, it's a great feature. So um, if you may be um, interested in, in, in going for it, you could also say, you know, um, why not offering such a feature then in, in a vehicle? So, but again, it's always thinking about philosophy. And if I think we have a more pure M Sports philosophy, I don't know if that's not fitting. Porsche also puts it in the um, 911 Turbo, but probably wouldn't put it in a very pure 911. And it's maybe also something they're thinking about that. So overall, I think it's surely a great Autobahn vehicle. And uh, most of the time, you know, when you have speed limit and so, um, it's more about having this silent and relaxing Autobahn ride and having the power when you really need to. BMW 5 Series in general and especially with the 550i here. The styling, really super great. I think I really love it because, especially in the Mediterranean blue, and it has sporty elements, but it's not too much. It's still elegant. And that's also the reason why I would prefer this one here to the very top, 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 M version that is to come because this one here has more elegance and the 5 Series is also about elegance. The interior also really refined. They stepped up the game in the 5 Series. I also like the sporty elements we find in the interior. But very important to go for the standard trim you get with the 550i because then you get the recommended seats which are very sporty and also more sustainable. Driving wise, hardly any other car in this segment can match the 5 Series in general already with the base engines. Therefore, just from price performance aspect you can easily go with the M Sports package outside and also inside and you also get the great seats and then you save money and still have already good performance. This one only if you have too much money left and really want an 8 cylinder. Yes of course it does give you a lot of performance and it's fun to drive for sure but already as said the base models give you a lot of good fun. I mean there's a lot of engine choices here. For sure this one is the more clever pick than the true M version I can already tell you so far because it also matches the car. At some point we also had it in the other reviews um, we've recently done at some point it's not really paying off if you get even more power then let's say the second most powerful version can be really a pick even if you just say I don't care about money I want the best car for me then I would still go for this one because you will get along better with it with more comfort also in the everyday driving life than the top of the line M model which would be rather more suitable for a racetrack but then again the question is this segment itself is it really suitable for a racetrack. The only generation of the Mercedes E-Class
starting with the front, what is significant here, the top AMG version has this dual fin in a horizontal way in the front grille, whereas for example the E43 has this diamond pin grille. And I must really say, I like the E43 more from the front design or also the AMG line you can pick for the lower models because I really fancy this diamond pin grille. This one here of course something different. Which one do you prefer more? Check it out. And here the top headlights, the multi-beam LED lights, also with this very interesting light structure. And what you can see already here from this perspective is that we get a very strong power dome hood right here with those designers. That is very beautifully done. And you can also see that this hood here is embedded. You can see the side spoilers are separated from the hood. A normal E-Class hood, if you're not thinking about the 63, is connected here to the headlights. So they try to differentiate it even more. And of course, as usual for those very sporty versions, this massive lower bumper style. 4 meters 92 or 16 foot 1 is the total length of this vehicle, means 6 centimeters longer than the predecessor version that accounts for all Mercedes E-Class models or E-Klasse as we say in Germany. Special with this 63 version is that we got the V8 bi sign at the side with this, well, let's say, kind of air outtake, but it's just, you know, for design purposes. Of course, we also have those four liter engine, a little bit less displacement than the predecessor under the hood. We'll soon come to the details of that one. It usually comes with 19 inch rims. Those ones here, the optional 20 inch. Um, you see it's a style combination between the gray on the inside and silver on the outer part. A little bit retro style, I think. And a red brake caliper as a contrast. And you can also see um, we've got other variations uh, inside this video here, also with other colors in our beauty shots, for example. Then you can check out some more of that. I would not pick a so-called night package because then the frames around the windows are in black. Well, if you more prefer an aggressive style, then you would do that. I more prefer the chrome style because I think it fits more to the E-Class especially. It has more elegance. The main design line is on the height of the door handles. You can see those are also a special design with chrome on the top and the color. This Cavesonite blue on the lower part and goes on here to a classic sedan style. And, um, you know, those versions are always also available as the team model or the estate version. Today we're starting with the estate, but there's also a team model in general E-Class review on Autogefühl, of course. And you can already see there is a small wing lip finishing the rear of the car. So while they had to enlarge the wheel arches on the side to fit also the bigger rims in the rear, they had to make the rear diffuser larger to appear stronger. And those ones here are special fake exhaust. I mean, they are beautiful fake exhaust, but they are still fake. The rear ones are hidden a little bit more deep in there. And you know what we get from you as feedback that most of you guys really don't like fake exhaust. And I mean, they just do it here because then they have a free play how to design the exhaust without interfering with the real technology of the exhaust. That's the reason behind it. And here the 63 features a big diffuser in the rear. And I mean, just visually for the 63S and the 63, there's not much of a difference. More about, you know, equipment, little bit of equipment. You get some more rim-wise and just more horsepower. That one we'll check out in the front. Let's now take a look under the hood. And while you start with the E43 with a six cylinder, this one here in the 63 models, this one is the eight cylinder then. 4 liters of displacement, that's less displacement than before in the predecessor version. It's the typical downsizing scheme. And with the 63 normal version, it starts with 571 horsepower. And this one here, the S version, 612. It's not too much of a difference. The acceleration is 3.5 or 3.4 seconds, 0 to 100 kilometers or to 62 miles an hour. So. The 63S you just pick if you want to say, okay, I want the maximum, 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 maximum that is possible. And the acceleration difference to the 43 model would be about 1.2 seconds that this one here is faster. This is the car key redesigned for the E-Class here with the AMG logo. 
also on the back side and um, you don't have this badge here when you buy the car this is just a, that you can see the number plate and as they have 15 vehicles here on location SEK by the way or SEK this is the SEK in Germany is a special force of the police interesting then here also keyless entry is from serial production you see the knob jumped up and we can get in and the first view for you now on the interior and this is of course the sporty spec of the E-Class and that means what comes with the 63 version first of all the steering wheel here has microfiber on the outside parts I really love it they could have used leatherette on the bottom and the top they did not but maybe they need some more years to evolve that same with the seats so what we can see here is the option the bucket seats I would not go for those ones so please go for the normal sports seats and the reason is who will use this car on the racetrack then it maybe makes sense but other than that the normal sports seats are already sporty enough have enough side support and they offer you more comfort for your everyday driving and then normal sports seats also come with standard with microfiber on the inside part and then genuine leather on the outside part and that's different from the 43 version that's very interesting because in the 43 version you have article on the outside parts which is a uh, fake leather and the best combination I'm not sure why they picked it uh, here in the other way I think it's the wrong decision you can also pick different styles here for example this one is the bright checkered style um, it reminds us a little bit on carbon fiber uh, but there's also a dark ca normal carbon fiber available for example or you can get piano lacquer wood would more be maybe for a normal e-class so this one here is definitely the sportier style and let's get inside as it is I mean from the basis version still a normal Mercedes E-Class it's also not too hard to get inside you sit a little bit lower of course then, I mean it's really a wow car you can uh, you can tell that because you almost get overwhelmed by this uh, fluent design it already starts at the inside of the doors we also have the Burmester sound system mounted right here and also the seat control is on the outside part so um, here you can still adjust something because here you got uh, for example the electric lumbar support and also the adjustment for the side bolsters you maybe hear that I can so control those side bolsters to pump it up a little bit other than that I control the seats right here for example to slide um, forward or backward again also the seat heating is placed right there the seating position again I mean it's not the most sporty one because we're still in an upper mid-size car segment um, but I can tell you already right now from driving it will be very sporty and the best thing is really the steering wheel that you have this grip here on the outside parts and with an electric control you can also adjust it um, as I would be driving personally I would really have it very close to me and maybe put the seat a little bit more backward but you might wonder sometimes when driving I have this steering wheel very much inside but that's the only reason that you can better see the gauges in the front but other than that I would probably more drive in that way maybe a little bit more behind so a lot of people make the mistake and sit too far away from the steering wheel and drive like this and then you don't have so much control over the car so always check your right seating position wow cockpit overview there you can really see it again this is the design concept of central purity that means not too much buttons especially in this area but then again central lines you see they are floating a little bit and they're overlapping gaps that would be you know uh, hidden right there so this is the design concept and that's of course i think the most um, you know emotional design concept in this car segment optional you can also get those huge screens a normal e-class also comes with analog gauges if you want to save some money or if that's let's say too overpowered for you because I mean it's really impressive look those two two screens definitely but then again is it maybe too much what is interesting and we can already show you that in the cockpit overview if you um, especially look in the more right area and this transition between the inside of the doors of the co-driver side here with the ambient light that is coming right the, over there that is really beautifully done and you can also change so much colors of that or not every color can be seen on camera that well because they also vary a little bit in the brightness but 
here, for example, red to red. The purple can be seen um, probably um, the best way. Um, even green is possible, but green can only be seen in total darkness um, or maybe just even white. But I really prefer a more purple or blue uh, ambient light in this case because it also fits the best to the very outside color. Interesting concept because if you don't have touch screens, what do you do to make the commanding easier? Well, they have a solution right here. Two touchpads for the thumbs and the left one controls the instruments, the digital one. The right one controls the other screen. We take a detailed look at there again quite soon. And here you can also, then if you uh, look at the central instruments with this, uh, you know, Speedo RPM digital meter <laughs> combined, then I, for example, can scroll through the consumption figures or the uh, range and stuff and um, also change complete views here. I can also have the performance view with uh, the turbo bar boost um, or also more information on the assistant systems. And um, we will also check out the autonomous driving function in this review later on. This will be very interesting. And I can basically control the whole infotainment screen from here or also change the whole design. This is the so-called progressive scheme. You can also pick classic would be like this that you have a separate rpm and speedometer it is different also in the amg version here than normal e-class or sport would be this one here with a yellow frame around and even more focused than on the rpm and now to the right central screen and i can either control it with my thumb again on the right steering wheel as i've shown you earlier this so is this the right tra trackpad now or also the you hear that clicking this is the central pad in the middle as we used from other Mercedes models. So you have both possibilities and um, you can change so much inside this infotainment screen. Um, it's almost endless. Um, the climate control two zone AC is by the way, um, yeah, switch on the ignition. Two zone AC is from standard equipment in the 63 and you can also get uh, more climate function even from the rear seat passengers so that would be possible here also look at those visualizations here with the uh, optional three zone ac again this car specced with so much options then let's go back this is the main menu where you can for example have some more settings change phone you can either connect via bluetooth like this this would be available or you can also use a cable and then um, because the apple carplay android auto is also available available here for example apple carplay the only thing is um, i would not really trust on that 100 percent because um, for example when i'm in the apple carplay mode then again, um, I cannot use the, use a touchpad at the steering wheel because the systems do not work together. So um, I would go for Apple CarPlay and also if I don't have an infotainment system in a car, but in a car where I don't, have, you know, something like this with a huge map and a really good infotainment system itself, also a Bluetooth handy connection for, uh, you know, free speech. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's perfectly fine for streaming your audio music. So that's the race track from above here, for example. Um, I can also, for example, do that zooming in with a touchpad thumb. So that's comfortable for the driver. And again, a big visualization, of course. So very impressive infotainment system. If you won't say maybe that's too much for me, that's over the top. But then again, it's also an option. The rest of the middle console is really big middle console and beautiful design climate unit that you can still control for example the temperature and where the vents are coming from um, not only in the screen and I think that's a good solution um, because some, I just want to have it a little bit warmer or colder in the car and that's an easy solution and even while driving and with this menu press here you can get in the comprehensive climate menu. An analog clock is fitted in every E-Class to make it a little bit classier in this upper mid-size segment. And here we also got the AMG logo and you can flip this one here up. And for example, store your phone right here or phones. Um, this one would be also the place to store your phone for the inductive charging option. 
Beverage holders are also placed right there. This is also the USB connection and the key can be uh, put right here. There's a special place for that one. Then this is the central infotainment command unit where you can go in the menu left and right and press if you want to select something. Then again, this one here can also be used as touchpad. You can scroll with this in the menu. So, so many possibilities in the highest spec to control the menu. And there's also an exhaust button. Then you can make the car louder or also change the whole driving modes with this here. Um, comfort, sport, sport plus and so on. We'll talk more about those when we drive the car. Storage space in the middle part. It's one of my favorite ones because it has this nice opening mechanism. More USB support would be there and you can of course clean it up with the cables and then you have also some reasonable space to store your stuff in there. Storage spaces for example here also at the inside of the doors for some water bottles and here the glove box slides down smoothly and well there's not too much space in here. Um, I mean we can live with that. So what about the rear? Also from here I can see the Burmester sound system speakers and I can just stress again it's the best sound system there is on the market at the moment if you pick the highest level of it. It has so many nuances in it. Um, I just tested it but not on camera because it really doesn't make sense because when you hear it over the camera sound you cannot really compare it and for music lovers this is really the best. Then what do we have here? Well we have enough space in front of the knees. Um, it changes a little bit depending on which seats you have. Sometimes you have sports seats which decrease the amount of knee room you have. Here with those I have the impression that they more yeah, that they give you a little bit more space. That's very interesting. Headroom wise I'm 1 meters 86 or 6 with 1. I still have enough space over my head. Um, so also if I lean back that works very well. More headroom you do have, of course, when you pick an estate version. I mean, it's a classic sedan here, so you sit, you stay, mm, it's not a very upside, upright seating position and you feel a little bit caged in here, although there's you know, enough space in front of your knees and above your head. Um, seating position in itself is of course comfortable but I prefer for example as a rear passengers prefer sitting in SUVs for example for that upright seating position also in the rear and um, you have to tell the front driver to put the seat a little bit higher that is possible even if you're a little bit taller that you can put your feet better underneath the seat that would be also um, a tip. More details for the rear passengers right here temperature the three zone AC and you can get this one optional. Then some more space right here and beverage holders and what you can do from here is flip the middle part that you can also do from here for the ski hatch function. Other than that you need to release the rear seats from the trunk. We have already done that now and then you can flip them around. Um, soon show you that. First of all, ESOFIX covers right here. There it is for child seats and on the two outer seats. And then if we flip the seats completely and again you have to release it from the rear. That's different in the Mercedes E-Class Estate or T model. There you can also flip the seats from here, from the rear. And then you can see there's also a top tether available to secure the seat, the, 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 the child seat also from the top part. That's very important. And this one would be a, well, you see a three part setup you can flip then. But again, here the estate is definitely more versatile. So the trunk area here for bag for, for example that you can use. Overall well it's usable, not the widest entry but this is a classic sedan that's the reason. You can also look through how you can load longer things and to release the seats that is here the lever you have to pull and then you have to go around and then push the seat down. It's not the best solution they found here and child safety and maybe not only child safety test because Mercedes has figured out that very well that they don't need too much resistance. The same by the way with the estate version that it automatically flips up again this electric version and 
We had an incident today <laughs> with uh, Jonas, my cameraman, and me, Thomas. So uh, we were sorting out some stuff here, and then uh, I was with my head right there, and then really got this electric hatch right there. It hurt a little bit, yes, but surprisingly, I was not hurt that much, and that proved that the system really works. And that's how it really closes. So that's the electric um, closing, and also works with the opening but that's not direct I think it's just with the um, with a with a mechanical parts that are right in here and by the way this little fella here I will use it today I will show you why Listen to the 
the sound here. So always braking at the pillows. They help us for the braking process. Here will be close corner. Again, acceleration. Oh, there's a bird. <laughs> professional instructor and I mean a lot of those guys are driving here we're meeting quite regularly and having partly the same experience but you have always the same effect that the car that is driving behind a professional racing instructor who are really good racing and professional race drivers the car directly behind it drives the fastest that time because you can really orient on the professional instructor and the further you're behind, then you lose a little bit of contact because, of course, you know, you're not the professional race driver. You can't orient so much on how the professional is driving and that makes so much difference. So, enjoy some more of the sound and here views to the front as you would be on the racetrack and of course you can also join our 360 degree racetrack experience that is available also in another video then with a little bit drier racetrack as well
So now some autobahn riding. And we'll start with an acceleration. Oh, let's go to Sport Plus that we can get on the motorway very fast. And we will also show you some of the autonomous features because you might not be racing all the time. So let's see that we can safely enter the motorway. Watch out to the acceleration. That was 0 to 130 with the race start. Whew. Always when you do that, it's um, really adrenaline rushing. And this is the moment also you feel the big difference between the E43 and the E63. That is when those 1.2 seconds faster from the V8 for a little engine really play in effect. <laughs> really in a, in a rush always. But this is also the funny thing about this vehicle. You can always go back to the comfort mode. And in the comfort mode it's really, as the mode says, very comfortable. As this one you see is still based on the air suspension, the air body control, and that makes this vehicle also that's not without a compromise, you know, because there are some sports cars that are so stiff and get so uncomfortable that you don't really enjoy them in driving every day. This is really the same enough also experienced from the E43. This one is from the setup a little bit stiffer, also we got those 20 inch alloys on. But still, you can have a comfortable ride because it's still based on this air suspension ride. So that's the best choice if you're able to spend so much money, of course. Yeah, about the autonomous features, if I, you, I can always drive, you know, freely on the motorway, of course. But then it's always possible to set this second lever, you know, the turning indicators and have the autonomous riding function. And you see that's, I mean, it's not thought that I take the hands of the steering wheel yet. I should not do this, but I can. And here I set the turning indicator for an overtaking. And I'm not hitting a throttle either, so I'm doing nothing. So just all the, all the car, I'm putting the turning indicator back. When the overtaking process is done, I can set it to the right again, for example. And when the car is not realizing any vehicles that are approaching from the rear, vehicle is doing the lane switch auto automatically and um, in this case Mercedes is also leading. So there I get the warning now I should touch the steering wheel and it's basically enough just to put a hand on the steering wheel but regulations as they are at the moment right now are still in a way you're responsible, you are controlling the car not the assistant systems. If you're doing a crash it's your fault your life and the life of your co-driver, camera driver. I also get the um, warning signal, by the way, in the head-up display, the special AMG Sport head-up display. So how it is meant to be used is rather like this. You keep the hands on the steering wheel loosely is enough. Then the car, you know, doesn't complain. And you can be a little bit more relaxed. So you're just letting the car flow. It's keeping you in the lane and by being more relaxed you also don't get so tired because if you're really you may maybe a little bit tired at first or stressed from the day but then the car is helping you you can have a little bit of, of relief and you don't sleep of course but you can be you know you can drive with less tension so the car is taking part of that and also of course always keeping the distance to the cars in front of you Luckily for today, we don't have a car right now in front of us. That's probably fine. So by the way, the GPS, um, I'm very satisfied with it from the from how the routes are being led. As I told you earlier in the interior review, sometimes it's a little bit complicated to enter addresses. That could be easier also with the, with the touch screen, especially. But other than that, um, how the direction is being led, that's really perfectly fine. And also how the, the visualization is taking place. About the consumption, of course, when we are going on the Autobahn here, it goes down, basically. Um, 
but you know a total mix so of course you know this this car is about a high consumption and at the moment we have a mix you know one or two accelerations autobahn ride some inner city ride and so at the moment we land up with about 14 liters on 100 kilometers and that's really not an unrealistic value you have to um, you have to calculate with that for sure so and again i mean this road here on the portuguese motorway i mean it's not the best motorway also as for the for the sound because it's really a rough surface but then again it doesn't get that slick when it's raining like it's now starting but again the mercedes e-class in general is one of the best insulated vehicles ever so even if we are at higher speeds on the motorway I, um, I hardly have to raise my voice so um, especially there's this optional sound insulation package and that one reduces the um, you know the the, outs, the outside noises in a way that it's almost bizarre so you're driving really fast and still you almost can hear nothing and you know that's um, that's really amazing and same is happening here of course the only difference is with the e63 if you compare it maybe with a smaller diesel or smaller petrol engine um, from a normal e-class you don't hear the exterior noise that much but of course you can hear this already when you accelerate slowly this is supposed to comfort mode and again you can see the, the big difference to that and especially sound wise there's a huge difference when you're in the sport plus mode because the exhaust then opens another valve also when you release as well it's blop. got those um, <laughs> those blop sounds from the exhaust and so you can really spice up your sporty life also on the autobahn and again really sw switch back to the comfort mode again if you want to so this car still has both and that's also a big difference to the predecessor this one here is sportier and comfortable at the same time so you got a bigger spread and you see this is also the main reasons why autocue cars here on our reviews are good if they have an autonomous driving function because then I can also you know be a little bit more Italian and use my hands while speaking so Mirilazia also best greetings to our Italian viewers today so that's it for the Automat driving last time you hear that sound here for today because that's the time for our conclusion and I think this car here looks really aggressive in the front no question but I think the E43 with this diamond pin grill that's my personal favorite as for the design of course this one here a little bit more aggressive in the whole style the sedan version has different taillights and of course the estate or the coupe version I'm looking forward to the coupe version that is to follow soon because the taillights are drawn more horizontally right there and I prefer that more or maybe also the estate version then also later on to come of course I want to hear your feedback on exterior interior and the driving experience as for me the interior really refined what we have seen with a great style and of course a great build quality the only thing is that you could say maybe it's a little bit over engineered because there's so much in this car available to control and to uh, adjust maybe it's a little bit over the top and that was also an important aspect if you compare it again to a 43 model why do they have to use Gino in animal skin here even in the seat combination mix whereas they don't do it in the 43 well the strategy is they think 63 people spend more money and then want higher quality but also do they want to uh, really you know go for the unsustainable way then I'm not sure if that's really still the right strategy as for the driving this one here can't be, be can't be beaten by anything else in this segment here I think at the moment because there's a really great um, great dynamic feature and I mean we've all seen on the racetrack there's always power and you never lack any power there can't be any more with the all-wheel drive of course you can also get it very well on the ground and I mean it was available before for the S version 
optional for the non-S version. Now you always get the all-wheel drive. I mean, some of the customers maybe want the rear-wheel drive still, but then maybe go for a C-Class, and that's still available with the 63 models. This is all more the pure sports car. This one here, and that's the final word for today, is really still, even with so much horsepower, a combination of a sports car and an everyday driving car, because it's still based on the air suspension, you can still ride it with a lot of comfort. The Volvo S90 R design A normal Volvo S90 taking German reference prices is about 40,000 euros. Then if you put an R design and a bigger engine inside, you get along 60,000 for sure already. And this test vehicle, vehicle is 80,000 euros, really expensive with a lot of extras. We will also tell you more about them on the inside. But what you do get from the R design trim level always is first of all the Thor's Hammer LED light with this um, also LED daytime running light design. Below that says full LED active high beam. So the LED headlights with the Thor's Hammer design you can also can automatically get with the R design. Otherwise you have to go for them optionally with the base limbs, base trim levels. Then the R design front grille with this black dot design and also a stronger lower bumper. An inscription S90 by the way would also, also V90 would have those vertical fins in the front grille. Um, and also the base models look different than this one. This one here is reserved for the real sporty version. The front camera over there have mounted inside the Volvo logo and you can see that the big front hood, hood has a gap here so it's not continued all the way to the front for insurance cost saving reasons that you don't have to replace the front hood in case of a small crash but it always takes something away from the design or what do you think? 4 meters 96 or 16 foot 3 is the total length of the S90 and it's the same for the V90 for the estate version where we also have a full review of course on Auto Fuel. You can check that one out later then. Here with the R design you have those matte aluminum style side caps here for the side mirrors and overall I think a very beautiful design. Not too many design lines but simplistic in a Scandinavian design. Our design comes with 18 inch rims, those ones here, however, the optional 20 inch rims, so the big ones, 21 inch is even possible. The riding comfort with those here is still fine, um, but still, of course, when you go for smaller rims, they always add a lot some more comfort. And if you go for bigger rims, they add more sportiness. You see a main design line is just placed above the door handles. The side profile is not that screaming out as the front. I found it very interesting here that this coupe style, like a window shape, doesn't go all the way in the round shape, but has this text, text, text style, um, you know, not textile, but tech, like technology style. We have another straight line here and we also see something resembling from this design scheme then again in the rear too. And here it is, what I meant, you know, with combining some round shapes but then again with straight lines and you see it's like a C holding that, holding that rear and we see a resemblance to the SUV designs at Volvo also when we soon present you the all new XC60, the compact SUV. I think the rear at the first sight I was really thinking, oh, I think that's rather ugly. But meanwhile it has grown on me a little bit. So I'm still more in favor of the very front of the vehicle and of the side profile. Overall a very beautiful vehicle to me. I want to hear your comments on that. The rear, not my really favorite part, but as I said, it grew on me, you know, it grew on me over the while, so I think, meanwhile, it's really okay. The exhaust tips here, they're all fake, whereas we have the diesel, the D5, and we have a lot of badges here, not only D5 for the, that diesel version, but also our design logo, all-wheel drive logo, and Polestar logo, because here we have some um, tuning, you know, a little bit more horsepower, a little bit more torque. <laughs> and the logos add up a little bit too much show off, isn't it?
So here we go with the engine or the engines. It starts with a D3 diesel, 150 horsepower, D4, 190 horsepower, or here the D5, 240 horsepower. And with the pole star tuning, you get some more torque, some more horsepower, not too much of a difference, more for the conscience. And then petrol engines is T5, 254 horsepower, or T6, 320 horsepower. And the bigger engines are always combined with all-wheel drive all the time. And for the lower ones, they start with uh, just with the front wheel drive and acceleration figure here is 6.9 seconds a little bit less with the horse uh, with the Polestar tuning so to 100 or 62 miles an hour and to 100 kilometers then with the T6 would be one second less 5.9 seconds this is the difference so this one already among the most powerful engines there is and the consumption we scored here in our test was 7 liters on 100 kilometers that should actually be a little bit lower. Um, you can compare it, for example, that we had with a 3-liter V, not V6, and we know it's inline 6, but 3-liter 6-cylinder uh, engine. We had 6 liters on 100 kilometers in our recent uh, touring review. So um, you see that uh, this downsizing is not necessarily a way of to lower consumption. Um, but Volvo decided that we just put here they say four cylinder two liter that they say we don't have to develop anything else you know um, there will be a three cylinder engine also for the XC60 but basically you can all keep the same size and use the same platform and it's then it's also very cost effective just to go for one cylinder and one displacement size So here we go with the key and I'm afraid I think it's animal skin around it. Then let's open the door and we have a good build quality. There's also real carbon fiber here for example. Uh, everything above that is a little bit softened up. Also the door handles, it's always making good impressions. You get 10 speakers with the R design already and here the optional bows and work and sound system even more speakers, even greater surround. I can really recommend them, especially in the concert hall setting. Then you have a great surround sound. One of our favorite ones, alongside with the Burmester 3D surround in the Mercedes E-Class. And this one here is then the R-Design interior. You can see, for example, that the steering wheel has an R-Design logo. The seats, they have this very sporty form in general, so you have more um, more side support for example here also in the shoulder area with the R design standard it comes with microfiber on the inside which is better because you then do not sweat in summer times and it's also not getting cold in winter times so uh, this one I think uh, even more one one and a half thousand euros extra you can save that money then let's get inside and you have a normal low sedan seating position but the seat form Volvo is using they are in general very comfortable. Uh, headroom wise, it's getting really close with 1 meters 86 or 6 foot 1. It's more about the panoramic roof, you know. So um, you can also, let's see, open the small panoramic roof like this. And uh, however, if you want more headroom, then probably you should leave out this option. What I also find beautiful is that you have a frameless rear mirror. So that looks very stylish and elegant. And if you look about to the dashboard here, for example, um, well, a lot of the parts are also leather red. It depends on which parts you have, but it's really hard to differentiate nowadays because the quality is also so good. Meanwhile, in the Bausen worker system, they have also an additional speaker right there. It's also very, um, very prominent. Design-wise also plays a role, for example. And the seat, you can also lengthen it in the very front here, like this, and everything else is being done electrically. And the steering column, that is still manual release, and then you can 
push it or pull it in all direction works pretty smoothly as well um, the only thing that I'm not so fond of is you know the, the buttons here at the steam way they make a little cheap appearance in general but the overall build quality is surely very good the instruments all digital as we can see them right here and if you start the car then everything flashes like this what do you think about them and optional, you can also get a head-up display, then you have a projection, for example, of the allowed speed and the real speed directly in your line of sight. General cockpit overview, we can see another carbon fiber uh, cover right there. And it's a really minimalistic design, all centered on this big infotainment system. 6.5 inch would be standard with the R design, also other higher trim levels. It goes then here with the 9 inch screen. Also with the R design, you have you know some features already included, not only like the foot foot packs and also the, the R design steering wheel. Also then um, autonomous emergency brake is with every Volvo S90 uh, from standard equipment. That's also good. Here, Artisan also includes the ACC, for example, and seat heating. Then the dash, uh, the glove box is actually quite spacious. You can also cool it as a function. You can just pull it, and then this one is being cooled. See horizontal lines, a little overlap here. I think very well thought out from the design. So it's a good Scandinavian design here. You have the automatic shifting lever. It always comes with a converter gearbox. So. There's no such thing as a dual clutch transmission here, um, even if some people think so. We had this discussion lately, but um, I asked them again, no, there's no dual clutch. You can also slide open the um, armrest here. There's a nice cover here too, works pretty well. And then you have beverage holders there inside, also 12 volt power supply and maybe just a small space in the front there again so overall a very likable interior let's see more about the details and functionality i like this crystal design we have at the driving mode selector which we, we talk about in the driving part and also when you start the engine just turn it to the right side you have also this it, it feels very good and it also looks pretty good and talking about details here very nicely done since 1959 Volvo starting here for the passenger vehicles and you know it's just on the seat belt holder here and why, why not putting some emotional details right there the famous German Spaltmaster, so the gaps you take a look at it, the building processing diesel, uh oh that wasn't supposed to be like that more like that, shouldn't it I guess <laughs> anyway, the rest of the armrest is really properly fixed that's nicely done well, the room is somewhat limited, disc you can put there, and two USB slots. One is uh, that you can also connect your phone, and the other one is just for charging, for example, if you have it connected with Bluetooth anyway. So, we're starting here, also with the crystal knob, and the interesting thing with the sound system is, I've set it to the concert hall, and this sounds so weird. If you have a radio then, and uh, have this echo sound, all radio voices sound pretty weird. Um, and the thing is, you know, you can you can always change it around again here with sound experience. This is Gothenburg Concert Hall. It's so great with music, but it's so bad with radio voices. Then you just go for studio, for example, or individual stage. But the concert hall theme is really great for all kinds of music that sounds really, really great. To the main menu you get there always, because besides those buttons there in the lower part, which are partly mandatory, everything is just centered here, uh, here with the sound experience, for example, um, connecting your phone, you can do it via Bluetooth, but also with the cable and then Apple CarPlay and such. Um, radio control, and here, for example, you get to the GPS. Um, you have to maximize it first, then you can scroll around it like this and also use it iPad alike. So, um, you know, that's working pretty well. See it right there. And some reaction times are also, uh, also really okay. You have to get used to um, that you have to control the temperature right there. I'll turn on the ignition that you can redo it to get to the, uh, yeah, to the vents function like this and to the temperature like this. And I think it's too complicated. 
If you think about how Tesla has uh, the solution there, it's also somewhat like this, but you can always have it. You know, you don't have to press it like this first. And I'm not really sure. Um, this is maybe something I would like to have as a, as a, as a separate knob, but am I too old school for this? Tell me in the comments. <laughs> then on the left side, you can go, for example, to the great camera system. What a great resolution here for the 360 view, but you can also click the separate cameras, never just a rear view camera here. And also you will have an alert when someone is approaching. So that's really, really helpful, especially for this vehicle, because the overall overview is not that good. You can also have um, all the adjustments for head-up display and uh, you know all the assistance systems you can um, activate there. So a lot of choices you can almost... Uh, you can also <laughs> press the headrest fold. I would attack Michelle in the rear. Ah, uh, they're already down. Otherwise, you know, the problem is the headrest fold. It does not... Uh, I can test it now again. Yeah, it, it does release uh, again. Um, they have to install a sensor that the headrest cannot fold when someone is sitting on the rear seat. They haven't done so far, although I've told them a couple of times now. And here on the right um, side, you can have some more uh, adjustments, but usually you don't use it. Most of the time you stay in the central one and then only when you want to reach a camera system. I also want to have a separate button maybe for the camera system if I'm in a parking lot because otherwise I just have to put in the rear gear, then I see the rear view camera. But sometimes maybe you're driving forward and want to have the 360 view. But here you can also switch it around again. So what about the rear compartments here of the S90? And it's a pretty long business sedan and you know the result of a knee room here is, I would say, average to small is still okay of course but sometimes we have such results here when we have way smaller cars so it's not the best package headroom wise it's really okay because the ceiling is raising again so i think with one meters uh, 90 or six foot two that would be the maximum um, of course a little bit better than if you have the estate the v90 uh, then it goes further on a little bit. But overall, it's also pretty cozy in here, for sure. Um, you can have also this manual shade here, more protection against the sun, great build quality also in the rear. You can fold down beverage holders like this, also some space in there. Um, it's not possible to open the ski hatch from here, you have to do it from the, from the rear. That's unfortunate. Temperature control, you can also optionally get a three zone control for the rear and you also have a separate cable plug, a real cable plug, that's nice. And then you can also release the seats from here and um, there are two buttons, I hope I don't press the wrong one now, <laughs> like this. Um, well, that was for the head restraints, so you can do that either or then the second button releases the rear bench and then you can either have this one here so it's a one third two third split so like this this is already a split and then you can for example also release the um the ski hatch right from here and the other one would be like here the the other third and here we go with the trunk you can open it right there it's an electric version of course it's limited as with every sedan but well pretty long loading area for sure here we also have a replacement tire. We also have a 12 volt supply right there. You can very well use it overall, but I mean, of course, the V90 would be the loading king in comparison to that one here. And to have you presented also how it looks folded, I'll electrically release it here once more, like this. Okay. Now we're stuck somehow. There we go. So, and here it is. And yeah, that's that's pretty long then in here. But again, of course, the sedan is never the most versatile version. So, let's go with the driving part. said earlier we have the D5, the big diesel, big in horsepower region, but of course not in displacement and not in cylinders because we all have the two liter and four cylinders. So this one here, acceleration wise to 100, 
it's not too far away from the T6, the most powerful petrol engine, which is at about 5.9 seconds to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour. And this one here is 6.9. So one second slower to 100 than the biggest petrol. And that, of course, means we have plenty of power here. So a normal overtaking process, for example, if you go from 80 kilometers to 100 with a kick down, I can show you that as soon as we can do that. So, blind spot monitor, by the way, with this red sign. So now 80 to 100. Plop. And 120. So you saw that went pretty fast as soon as the kickdown happened. But for the kickdown or until the kickdown, the car did take some time. You can change that, however, a little bit when you go to the driving mode selector and go for a dynamic. And when you're in a dynamic mode, the car does not need so, so much time to shift down when it then push the throttle a more immediate response. Also I can use the shifting pedals to just manually shift down or third gear. Force diesel is also not the worst sound when we push it a little bit. Why not? We also have the air suspension mounted in here which is a little bit of a pity because I would love to test the R design suspension but they didn't have a test vehicle for that yet. The reason for that is the normal R-Design pack also then includes the R-Design suspension which is the normal suspension put a little bit lower and the air suspension as soon as you have that one you have the very same air suspension as if you have no R-Design at all. But the reason for that air suspension in this vehicle is that the manufacturers tend to put every spec that is available into a test vehicle to show off the very very best of a car and we always argue come on why not a mid trim level to have a more customer realistic car really try to force the issue and most of the time it's really sad that it's not possible in general you have good comfort also in the city and you have the slower rides, you have a good seating position. The Volvo uh, seat forms are usually very good as for the comfort. And a lot of after other customer experience also told us that. The visibility is somewhat limited in this sedan. The rear window is not too big. And also the, door, the do doors are thick and the windows are pretty slim also at the sides so there are definitely cars which have a better overview also when looking to the front also from the seating position wise without the camera systems you do not have the best clue of where the car is actually ending but lucky we have the good camera system that is really helping a lot when you're getting around some narrow parking lots so i'm really glad to have them here so introduced with the S90 or the V90, we also not only have the adaptive cruise control, but also the pilot assist. And the pilot assist works up to a speed of 130 kilometers now and takes over this semi-autonomous function. It can be really autonomous in, um, in pure traffic, for example, so that works. But of course, it's not meant to be that the car is totally driving on its own fully yet. But of course, it's really helpful when you're stuck in traffic and just rolling and don't want to, uh, you know, don't want to uh, do anything by that. You can also adjust this distance at the steering wheel, for example, the distance with which shall be kept. So let's see. Maybe we we also approach a red traffic light, and then hopefully the car. Let's see if it's already active. I'm not sure so it should be. Just here for sh you know show off purposes. You shouldn't do that. So it's, the system is not meant to do that yet. I'm not sure if it's active yet. So it shows me a Volvo steering wheel. It does. 
I'm out ready anyway, but no car in front of me, too bad. <laughs> so sometimes, I mean, I, I'm, I'm lucky to have no traffic and uh, not to be able to test uh, those stuff. But I've had it uh, once already in the XC90 where it was limited to a lower speed. And for traffic it worked pretty well that you can just you know roll in traffic and also the steering work is being done in traffic. And the same thing we have um, experienced also with BMW or Mercedes that to a speed of 30 for example it works totally autonomously also in the traffic. I think it's one of the examples where it's really good to, to have that one. So with the air suspension of course everything is rather set in comfort and that means you don't have a too agile handling in general but you can then again switch around a little bit with the driving modes for example you also have the eco driving mode for coasting or sailing function and yes i do say sailing even if um, someone said you know that's not called sailing but um, there are actually manufacturers even who call it sailing if you just let the car roll even mercedes uses a small sailing boat symbol when the sailing function is active and it means just that there's no throttle input and the car just rolls but also unclutches that it can really freely roll as it would be in neutral but the difference is in neutral gear it would just still run on the you know on the neutral uh, running running order so on the neutral rpm and still consume more fuel so with the eco mode the car rolls better and also it's very silent in here when you're just having it at lower RPMs, you can roll, relax, set for example the adaptive screw control. Maybe I can just go behind this car here. You can also check again in my left mirror now when some people think they can drive faster as it is loud, as it's happening quite often in Germany. There's a red symbol in the side mirror then. Now already with the ACC, by the way, you see here the lane is being kept actively with the steering wheel. See, count the steering a little bit again. Again, the system after a while says take your hands and steering it again. Of course, regulations are not that far here. Oh, I'm not so not braking at all at the moment. So the car is doing that. Now the warning, Thomas, what the hell are you doing? Now also the car is accelerating on its own again. I'm not doing anything at the moment. So it works pretty well and. From the technology wise, they would be able to go through with it all the way. It's actually not a problem. But again, regulations have to be in place for that. And of course, you are still responsible yet. But Volvo is one of the first manufacturers that said, if we're at the point where fully autonomous driving is possible, we also take the responsibility for accidents. And as soon as they really do that, I don't see anyone buying another autonomous vehicle if the other manufacturers do not say that. So that is basically coming, for sure. Actually pretty relaxing. I mean, it's meant to um, have the hands on the steering wheel because you're still responsible and at the same time you can relax more still if you know that the vehicle is doing something. Sound insulation wise also, I don't have to raise, raise my voice at all. It's pretty, pretty silent in here. So a very relaxing ride. Um, you also don't feel too much difference that the uh, air suspension is just in the rear because the front suspension is also very soft and comfortable so that's not too much of a difference. I really like it just to slightly accelerate with the car because everything goes pretty smooth and silent and you also do not feel so much that it is a diesel so with some vehicles you know oh that's a really old diesel you feel it you hear it and feel it. here if you, you wouldn't know at all and um, also maybe if you leave the start up oh it's a nice sl vintage car then you wouldn't really feel a difference immediately you know if it's really a diesel or, or a petrol engine oh great people throwing off their plastic bags from the window well done and it also happens. So, to put it to 100 again, and the pilot assist again. It's working when the when the steering wheel is green, and now it's this now is working up to a speed of 130, and we're driving 100 at the moment. So then also the steering system here works. Just to show you now when I take the hands off. Um, when I'm doing some lane changes, by the way, you see that, or maybe also feel that. 
little bit of me, Jamie Began. Car is really soft in the suspension, and that means when you're doing a fast lane change, you also feel the car is tilting. So um, if you want more agility, you can also go to the dynamic mode with this car here, basically. Let's see if this is a big difference when doing some lane change. Yeah, it's actually really stiffer. People behind me really think probably is this guy totally crazy. But you know, of course, how to fuel safety first. And this already helps if you put it into the dynamic mode and it's not tilting that much and giving you enough confidence, definitely. So to me, um, you know, I more prefer comfort in general, but for more dynamic driving, it's good to have to have a different driving modes. And uh, sometimes, actually, the differences are not that big between the different driving modes. But here, it makes this a really notable notable difference. So, I mean, it's it's not a real, real sports car. That's 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 for sure. But it's good to have the um, the possibility to change. And then maybe you can think about. If you want to spend the money really, you know, this can probably make up for the R design suspension we do not have in here because you have the, the possibility to change it. And it was really a big difference between them. Normal mode where the car was tilting a lot, and then the dynamic mode where I get a little bit more response. But in general, this is still about a comfortable ride. Pilda behind us, A6, I think, A6, or A4, no, should have been, should have been A6, a little bit wider. So now, still approaching the countryside. See, we're in dynamic mode once more. The only thing, you know, with, with the engines is pretty silent when you're not hammering the throttle, but as soon as you're in sport mode, you're going 3,000 RPMs and so on, then, then you do hear them. But in general, as I said, a refined diesel they're using there. I'm not the biggest diesel fan, that's for sure. And the question is also, what about the general future of the diesel engine? Because it will get more and more expensive to get them right to, to the clean regulations. So we will see more CNG cars popping up, more electric vehicles. Also, more petrol engines, which will soon be also integrated with the particle filter. So, and diesel registrations are already starting to diminish a little bit. You already feel the differences. But yet again, there is no true alternative yet if someone is really riding like 40,000 kilometers a year. Then the diesel is still a way to go, and we have to see what evolves there in, in this respect. Probably only yeah, CNG could be a solution there, or fuel cell if you have the fuel station and you want to spend the money for the fuel cell vehicle, that's for sure. So let's see about the pilot assist. Can I also activate it in standstill? No, it's actually not working. Ah, there it is now. Ah, I still have to accelerate myself then, but now it's working. Let's see, let's set it to 60. Well, see, sometimes you have to take um, responsibility, responsibilities yourself. It's not always working perfectly, but we're getting there. And I, th I think it's already good to have such a system that you, sometimes you're in traffic, you can just relax a little bit. Or maybe think about the traffic where you're stuck really a long time and then get something to drink, to eat, maybe while you're rolling with 20 or something. That is, um, that is a good solution then. Yeah, we had that recently. <laughs> so I know. So in the countryside, you're also pretty relaxing. Hey, I want to set the cruise control lower again. I wonder that they, they can't press the minus button at the steering wheel, and then it's just the current speed is set. I have to really press minus, minus, minus again, they get the lower speed then. It's a little bit unpractical, so now I'm at 50. The steering wheel is a little bit different than in the normal version but it doesn't make too much of a difference. The steering itself is pretty light, especially in the normal driving mode. So I then go, oh wait, I am in dynamic mode already. So that's a little bit astonishing. 
So the steering could be a little bit more progressive and could feel a little bit natural. It feels Arcadi-like, very soft. So I think that could be improved to give you a little bit sportier feeling. But in general, it is still a lot of fun to drive the vehicle. It doesn't feel too big when, when driving, although it is already a big sedan. Just when you're searching for a parking spot, then you feel the width and the length of the car. Other than that, due to, then again, this is the advantage, due to the light steering, the car doesn't feel too big then anymore. But here again, if you're in normal driving mode, sometimes it feels like, you know, you can just sit here, like with what, two fingers, turn it all the way around. That is handy again in city situations, but if you think about an agile driving part, you might, um, missed it. I mean, there are certain differences between the other premium manufacturers uh, in Volvo and I hope I could clear some of those. But you can definitely say it's not that anyone would be lagging totally behind the others. Every of those premium manufacturers have something special, something unique and something which is maybe not that good if compared to the others. But this one you can clearly have as a, as a true competitor also to the other premium vehicles. You know, with a different screen concept. General, definitely set on a comfortable run. So I would, um, you know, as Audi and BMW, rather go in that sporty direction. I would, driving-wise, from the driving feeling, rather compare it to a Mercedes E-Class. Although I think the E-Class is, when you have all, you know, also the air suspension equipped, is in general the most comfortable vehicle in that upper mid-size segment. Also the E-Class has the air suspension at the front axle too, whereas here we just have it at the rear axle. So it does make a little difference, but still at a, at a very high level. And cost-wise, I mean, they're all so expensive anyway. I've talked to you earlier, 80,000, over 80,000 bucks for this car. Whew, that is really something. You feel the serenity and the elegance of the car also while driving. And yeah, yet again, you have to pay a lot of money for it. And when you have to search for a good offer or maybe a clever leasing deal because just giving 83,000 euros on the table that is really something, and I would think twice before doing that, for sure. I think to sum it up in the driving part, again, setting on comfort, elegant sovereign ride, up to the competitors, that's for sure. Something really to, to enjoy. A Volvo S90 R design overall. For sure, a lovely vehicle, especially design-wise. I love Scandinavian design, and I think a lot of you share that too. Aggressive, but yet still elegant design, especially in the front. So uh, most do agree to that. Also, the side profile, well, rather conservative, but still appealing. The rear, you have to get used to. Um, that is, you know, more maybe aligned with the rest of the design, with the estate, with the V90. But overall, I think a great design piece, also from the interior styling, I like it very much. Um, how to control everything electronic-wise, infotainment system, I think um, that is a little bit easier in other vehicles. You have to learn a lot of the functions there that you really get along. It's not the most intuitive systems, uh, especially also with, you know, with the temperature control. Comfort-wise, they are really on top of the game. But that's also always been the case with Volvo. They just have to think about their animal skin policy, which they are actually doing. You know, Thomas Ingenlard, the main designer of Volvo, chief designer, he said we have to think about a car interior beyond leather. That's what he said. Other than that, autonomous driving, for example, is already really evolved and Volvo is going all the way with there and also safety equipment. I like it that they include a lot of safety features from standard equipment. Other manufacturers should do it as well. And then optionally you can get almost everything you can think of. So Volvo is also uh, taking a big part in this overall autonomous driving or assistance systems evolving process. And now to our conclusion. Well, it's really not easy taken that you can spec those cars in a way that they will somewhat end up with equal prices, well in most markets the Mercedes will be a little bit more expensive. But we really have to look at 
sum up the features in pros and cons. The BMW 5 Series has the most conservative styling, the Mercedes E-Class and the Volvo S90 the most sensual one, the Audi A6 the most angular, the most clean one. The same counts for the interior, where Audi A6 and BMW 5 Series show the best build quality. Mercedes offer the best seating materials with a range of fabric, leatherette and microfiber. As for controlling the vehicle, the Audi is the most intuitive and easy one to control, whereas controlling something while driving might be better suitable with the classic controls of the BMW 5 Series. In driving, the Mercedes offers the softest air suspension in the non-AMG models. BMW has the best suspension when you do not pick the air suspension. The Audi is surprisingly sporty already in the normal model version. As for driving, the Volvo S90 clearly lags behind its competitors as steering input and suspension do not match the precision, sportiness and comfort which is given at the same time with all of its competitors, especially with Audi and BMW. They master to give you the balance of sportiness and comfort already with the base model, whereas Mercedes really splits their comfort versus sportiness with the base versus the AMG models. The BMW gives you the most fun natural driving experience. The Audi feels like the most modern car. Mercedes and Volvo, however, try to give you something more special as for the overall design experience. Volvo also takes their own approach with just offering force in the engines. That could be a good thing if they were more economical, but they are not. The best engine of all is the 3 liter BMW diesel as it gives you the best price performance and power to consumption deal. And the final pick? Well, that's really hard. And it also depends on the concise offer you get at the dealers. So if one of those is a couple of thousand less expensive for you, that might also be your answer. Price aside, the A6 at the moment seems like the best overall car but the others seem to deliver a little bit more emotion. And you cannot deny the good driving feeling of the 5 Series.